September 8th Common Council <clears throat> meeting. Please call the roll. Allison Osby. Here. Crosey. Here. Mugerower. Here. Erickson. Here. Cashel. Here. Ford. Here. Palmieri. Here. Present seven. Councilmember Allison Asby will lead us in the invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. We are mindful of the blessings of liberty that we have in this nation. May our decisions tonight improve the quality of life in our city and for our residents. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, so this evening we have a presentation by Greater Oshkosh Economic Development Corporation's uh, mid-year report. Mr. White? Over here for presentation, yes. To, you're, you're right. Thank you very much. Um, most of you know me, but my name is Jason White, uh, Greater Oshkosh Economic Development Corporation. Um, definitely a surreal experience to be here. Um, every time I go out, it's interesting because so many people that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, it's now a rare occasion or a special occasion. So uh, it's uh, pretty exciting to, to be here tonight. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think like a lot of other organizations um, you know this certainly has been a been an interesting uh, time um, you know our mission obviously is to grow the greater Oshkosh um, economy um, we really have pivoted uh, this year in a lot of ways uh, with our mission to try to help and in, in many cases save as many companies as we can through uh, the installation of new tools um, resources and also being just a resourceful contact ourselves uh, to connect uh, as many companies uh, to f different forms of assistance that have come come to play over the last number of months. Obviously, the city of Oshkosh has been a big partner in that with us, so we thank you very much, and uh, not only for the support of us, but certainly for the support that and the tools you've created to allow us to help uh, a number of companies in our region. I always like to start off with the good news, um, and that is uh, this year, um, Oshkosh has been fortunate to be ranked um, by a publication called Smart Asset in a number of different ways. Number three in uh, City for Working Parents, number 19, Best Places for Retirees to Live and Work, and number six, uh, Most Livable Small Cities in America. So anyway, the number of these, um, or at least one or two of these, uh, Oshkosh has been ranked in the past, um, sometimes higher or lower. but. Uh, certainly noteworthy that uh, we continue to be ranked uh, nationally uh, for being a great community to live, work, and play. So in 2020, um, COVID-19 uh, struck and Greater Oshkosh struck back. Um, in January, uh, Greater Oshkosh held a strategic planning retreat to kind of map out our next three years. Um, and by March, uh, everything that we talked about in January was pretty much uh, null and void because our world had changed and turned upside down. So we struggled to get back to that, to be honest, because of the uncertainties that lie ahead for our future, all of us, um, and not knowing how long the pandemic will uh, be in place uh, to impact our lives. But nonetheless, one way that we did pivot, obviously, was recognizing uh, the urgent call that we had uh, to step up in this time uh, to address some of the issues and impacts from the situation. Uh, one of the ways that we did, uh, we started off real quick, I think within two weeks, um, we partnered with both the city of Oshkosh and Winnebago County uh, to set up upwards of $1.5 million of assistance uh, that could be made available for small businesses throughout the county. Um, I would say the bulk of that, majority of that, made available to uh, businesses in the city of Oshkosh. Uh, one, the one that impacts you or pertains to you the most is the Greater Oshkosh Emergency Response Loan Fund, uh, where 18 loans have been uh, provided 
uh, for a, a total of $175,000. Um, those loans come in $10,000 increments. Uh, that's the maximum that anyone could borrow. Those are 2% two, two interest loans. And um, we haven't had any repeat borrowers, so those are all individual businesses. Um, and then the second was the Winnebago County Rapid Recovery Loan Program, where, again, this is a countywide uh, fund uh, through the IDB Industrial Development Board at Winnebago County, where 33 loans were provided to 32 businesses. There was one business that applied for applied twice for two different businesses or two different uh, LLCs, and um, for $303,000. So, as you can see, there's still a lot of money that's still available. Um, the further that we've gone into this, uh, the fewer applicants that we've had. We had one today that did apply for the Winnebago County Rapid Recovery Loan Program. Um, I think one of the other reasons, the further we get into this that we have, or one of the reasons that we've had fewer applicants is that businesses want to figure out a way to either pull themselves out of this without taking on more debt, or they've reached a point uh, from a sobering standpoint where they don't believe the debt uh, will assist them at this point in pulling themselves out from where they're at. So um, very worried about that, to be honest. Um, that, uh, that th these programs are no longer attractive to many companies because of th they're no longer willing to take on that debt, whereas they were at the early outset, outset of the pandemic. We're going to continue to maintain these programs so they're still <coughs> available, but um, the debt part of this is no longer as appealing the further we down the road we get into the pandemic. Uh, process for Greater Oshkosh Emergency Loan Fund. I'm not going to go too much into this, but it, I think the important part of this is how quick and nimble it is where, you know, a company can apply, apply on Tuesday, the committee meets on Thursday to review it, and then the next Monday or Tuesday they can get their check for $10,000. Uh, the goal is to help as many companies as possible. We haven't turned down many businesses, so uh, the other aspect of it is that there is a deferral of interest in principal payments. Uh, so. Uh, there's not, no payments that are, that are due right away. Also had really, those who have uh, been assisted for this program, uh, we've been very active in collecting testimonials about how this has helped them survive and move forward as a business. So uh, that's something that we believe is very important uh, to continue to, to share what the, that impact is and how it's been able to help. One other thing that we did do uh, is that we were very active when WEDC rolled out the we're all in grants. Um, we were able to write and assist, in many cases, um, the bulk of the applications for 170 uh, businesses in uh, the greater Oshkosh area by supplying them with either a acknowledgement uh, letter, which was required, or uh, helping them a little bit further with their application. We also helped a number of businesses um, as a conduit um, for some of the state and federal programs. Uh, again, we started this out with this uh, thinking that there weren't, assuming that there weren't going to be other programs available. So I think that's another reason why uh, we, we've made a lot of loans, but maybe we haven't made as many is because fortunately our state and federal partners did step up, although some of those programs are now passed as well. So um, our businesses obviously are, are still needing assistance. We also uh, have been holding weekly meetings with partners, 20 to 30 partners from throughout our area. Uh, we initially thought that we would do this for a couple months just to compare notes about how everybody's helping one another in, during this time, but there was a lot of um, desire to keep those meetings going. So every, every Wednesday we meet as uh, partners of the community to share notes and compare notes about what we're doing to help one another in our constituencies uh, thrive in, during this time. And then we also have a, a Facebook page that we created that we're adding resources as they become known. I added one a couple days ago of a new grant that's available through the state uh, for cultural um, or organizations, art, art, the arts, cultures, the cult, culture, industry, culture and arts industries uh, and business uh, organizations that have been impacted by the pandemic. And again, uh, additional testimonials to talk about how much uh, this assistance has been helpful to them. Um, one other example just to how uh, we've been able to help is in un unforeseen ways. 
So we were reviewing one of the applicants for a uh, Greater Oshkosh Emergency R Response Loan, and there, there was a business that was struggling with who they were working with to get a PPP uh, loan from the federal government. And one of our uh, members of our committee stepped up and said, I, I can help you, I can get that for you tomorrow. And uh, one of the, uh, the applicant has been spending a lot of time in Rochester with his wife, uh, bat who was battling cancer, was able to take that burden off their shoulders right away uh, and get them the assistance 24 hours. So again, some of those little things that weren't so little to those who applied at that point. Um, one of the things that we thought about early on was maybe we should do a survey and talk to our companies and see how this is impacting them. Uh, fortunately, UW Oshkosh was already working with New North and some statewide partners to do that. So over time, uh, over every month, they've been uh, surveying businesses and inviting businesses to complete the survey. And you can see uh, kind of where things are at as of the latest survey by UW Oshkosh in terms of people's comfort level to uh, return to work physically, leave their homes. Um, and uh, and, and one, the, one of the things I think we're, we've been eyeing too is uh, district school, you know, school district plans and how that's uh, impacting day-to-day -day lives of, of people and um, their ability to work and how that's impacting employers um, and some of those potential dis disruptions. Um, one of the things too is it's interesting is while well, a number of our industries lost employment over the first few months of the pandemic, most of them have experienced an uptick in the last uh, couple months. The one industry that never dropped at all, interestingly, was construction. So construction has remained very strong during this time. So um, I think, you know, just anecdotally, we saw a lot of businesses that were improving their parking lots, things like that, because they didn't have people, employees physically at work. And, but uh, also, you know, home built, home construction, um, odd jobs and, and things like that have uh, really gone strong as well. And of course, good news too is that unemployment claims continue to drop. Um, one of the things we've been working on with New North um, is a campaign to encourage our region to fill out the census. Uh, obviously that impacts municipalities such as the city of Oshkosh. Winnebago County ranks third in the New North region with census response. So um, Oshkosh still has a little bit of work to do to uh, meet the response rate of 2010, but overall we rank very high uh, across the state. Uh, it's also important to note too, and you know, obviously it's, you know, there's a lot of concern and there continues to be a lot of concern, but there's also been good growth as well. Um, there's been some uh, very visible projects, obviously, like the Mine Shaft, Extreme Customs, All Row Steel, Oshkosh Food Co-op, uh, but then also some others. Um, you know, the, the Women Airport Terminal, uh, tremendous uh, project uh, enhancing the gateway of our community from the sky. Um, and also Parker Hannafin and a couple of businesses that have located, um, I guess, the Binlin Industrial Park in the north end of town, where uh, Art Dumkey has done a tremendous job of taking older industrial buildings, rehabbing them, uh, removing blight, um, which most people don't know is there, fortunately, <coughs> but into improved uh, properties for new business for businesses to move into. We have had uh, continued to have property searches. Um, we've heard from some site selectors that say, "Hey, we're not traveling right now," so um, their plans are on the back burner. But we've continued to receive leads from New North, um, just kind of seeking the land, seeking out the landscape in terms of what's available for real estate. So uh, we've probably received one or two a week. Um, we also have even a couple of smaller ones here. We had a working with a restaurant right now that's looking for a bit larger space, believe it or not. And so we're, we're hoping that that's a good side, obviously, for um, the restaurant industry. That obviously that there are businesses that are growing and and doing well and, and want to continue to grow. Uh, Revolving loan fund. Um, here's a couple of recent applicants that received uh, support. Uh, we have a $250,000 application right now that our committee is reviewing of a manufacturer on the north side of town. Um, and we also have um, another one that we awarded recently for $40,000. So, uh, so there continues to be activity on business growth. 
as well. So I think that's also uh, a very positive comment as well. Capital Catalyst, um, we've done two rounds of Capital Catalyst and of course this money is available to high growth startups in targeted industries like medical, manufacturing, IT, agribusiness. And uh, we have done $500,000 of loans and grants. Um, there's a part of it from the state that's required, requires us to make grants in some form to businesses. Uh, so $500,000, we've applied for another round with the state, $250,000. Uh, when, when we do that, that's matched by the revolving loan fund that the city has allowed us to manage over the last five years. So we're hoping the next 30 days we'll hear a positive comment on that. Uh, the transload, which obviously you all know quite a bit about, um, and uh, the reason that that project came together. Uh, but we, we continue to view that as an asset. We've updated our industrial park maps. Um, the transload is serving in business and industry within a 90 mile radius of Oshkosh. You don't need to be along the transload or along the railroad to take advantage of that shipping opportunity uh, from truck to rail or rail to truck. And uh, it's another, another good avenue in, uh, for, for uh, economic development here in the greater Oshkosh community. Something that we currently are doing um, is that uh, when, when I started, Champco was responsible for administering the restricted covenants for the industrial parks in Oshkosh. Um, we made some amendments to the covenants to uh, make things more in line with the city code when the city code uh, was updated a couple of years ago. Um, those changes have to be approved by the tenants of our industrial park. And so we've called a meeting of the tenants for October 5th uh, at four o'clock at the Oshkosh Convention Center just to discuss what those changes are and to get their sign off. So um, I think there's gonna be a virtual option for businesses to participate too if they want, but, but basically we're asking for their vote um, so that we can continue to move forward uh, with when projects come forward, we can sign off or review them to make sure they're in conformance of the, of the uh, covenants. The Winnebago Catch a Ride program, um, this is our volunteer driver program that takes people to work and takes them home. Um, you can see the stats through January through August, from January through August. Um, we've done a lot of rides. We've done about 200 plus rides a month, which is a good thing. Which is not a good thing is that 4% of our rides have been provided by volunteers. Um, obviously the pandemic um, hit that in a big way. Uh, and now we're seeing some volunteers come back, which is good. Uh, but obviously this was an unforeseen uh, casualty uh, in our ability to uh, provide rides by volunteers. Now we have picked up on that by uh, using traditional uh, transportation means such as cab rides and other uh, transportation options, but those are costly. So the, 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 those rides have eaten into our budget a little bit but to really make this program work, we need volunteer drivers. And uh, fortunately, we've got a couple of new ones over the last couple of weeks, but obviously to make this program work uh, from an economic development, workforce development standpoint, we need more volunteer drivers. And then finally, for those who don't know our team, um, that's the team, a Greater Oshkosh. Uh, we also have a 27 member board uh, of which uh, Mr. Roloff serves as the city representative on our board and on the executive committee and has since I've been here. So uh, we appreciate that as well. Um, but uh, anyway, just wanted to kind of make sure you knew who the faces were behind Greater Oshkosh in terms of the day-to-day -day team as well. So uh, Trisha joined us um, when Audra left and she's been administering the Revolving Loan Fund and also the Winnebago Catch a Ride program. And uh, Andrea is uh, doing our marketing uh, site selection efforts, working with commercial real estate uh, brokers and uh, doing a lot of that kind of work as well. So, and then Art's in charge of our resource development, but he's also been administering the Winnebago County Rapid Recovery Loan Program. So, uh, so with that, I'm going to conclude and see if anybody has any questions. Council Mayor Booker Hour. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If you don't have any questions, as always, appreciate the uh, the update from from Mr. White, but I think um, it shouldn't it shouldn't go unnoticed that um, for too much longer we need to. I'm, I want to publicly acknowledge and, and thank you and your staff 
and the full board for everything you guys have done over the last few months with, with the world, as you mentioned, being turned upside down pretty quickly. Um, you know, you refocused your efforts on trying to keep keep businesses open, keep uh, employers employ, you know, uh, employees employed, and um, along with several other of our, other of our valued partners in the community, you guys did a fantastic job in trying to help as much as possible, as quick as possible. So just whether it's just for me or from this council, thank you for everything you've done uh, in that short time and, and how quickly you did it. So yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Just a follow-up question. Uh, for those volunteers that do uh, volunteer to provide rides uh, to jobs for <coughs> folks, do they get their mileage reimbursed? They do, yes. Um, and that's been part of the challenge recently is that a lot of those monies that we're going to reimburse drivers are now paying uh, primary service providers, like, uh, again, cab companies and, and those um, who, are, who are, can provide those services in the absence of volunteer drivers. But you're correct. There is a mileage reimbursement rate of uh, 58 cents a mile that is um, paid for either by the user uh, or in combination through us or another party. And so if somebody's interested in applying to be a volunteer driver, they just go to your website or call your office? Correct. Yep. Then go email anybody in our team. Trisha would be the primary team member. Trisha.rathermel at greateroshkosh.com. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. Next on our agenda is uh, public comment on agenda items. Um, before we have those who've registered to speak, um, I do have an email to register that came in uh, from Terry Rushing uh, regarding resolution 20-392. Uh, I believe council got copies of this. Um, uh, basically thanking for the consideration of the installation on new sidewalk on West Waka. Uh, parents live out there and says that the local residents are active and walk and uh, sidewalk would greatly enhance the safety of walkers and comfort of drivers so thank you mr. rushing for sending that in uh, clerk who do we have registered to speak uh, for public comment Robert Heisler 5869 East Island Drive Butamore uh, I own Shures Hall and uh, resolution or number 14 resolution 2392 I own about 200 feet along the proposed sidewalk area and uh, I don't know if there I don't see any walkers out there because of COVID-19 my business was down 90 percent this year it's going to take me five to ten years to pay for it to come back to normal and this is going to be like the last nail in the coffin where I got to pay for extra sidewalk for something that isn't hardly used. The other side is the uh, um, bus uh, load or bus stop. It's on the other side of the street, which is the mall side, which you think would have more traffic there. And I just don't see why you got to put a side back to no man's land, and I got to pay for something that I ain't gonna be able to afford for 20 years. I mean, this is just the wrong timing. It's businesses like mine, uh, businesses like the hotel was right next to me. They got more fringe than I do. They spent over a million dollars last year in remodeling that hotel, and they've been devastated just like I have. And this is just the wrong time to start adding sidewalks to really, there's nothing out there. Um, especially when the bus stop's on the other side of the street. They did the same thing for my restaurant. Bus stop's on the other side of the street and ran a sidewalk along my restaurant, and there's, nobody walks on it. I don't see one person a day walk on that sidewalk. They all go to the other side by the bus stop, but why do you put a sidewalk when the bus stop is on the other side of the street? So just for consideration, this is just the wrong time to spend all this extra money. Even if the year or two years down the road, it's just going to kill me. It honestly is. This COVID-19 has killed a lot of businesses, especially the restaurant industry and the hotel, hotel industry. And I'm just asking that you just hold off on this um, resolution 14 for a year or two. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Luke Bergstrom, 329th Street, Nina. Hi there, 
Thanks for having me again. Um, uh, I'm also speaking on behalf of Resolution 14. Um, I spoke on this issue at the August 12th Common Council meeting uh, where I established that a certain stretch of the proposed sidewalk from our storage facility uh, that goes through a field and ends before the hotel doesn't quite go to the corner uh, was essentially a sidewalk going nowhere and a proposed delay on voting on this issue was brought up as a, a claim that it would in fact connect to the, the frontage road at, at some juncture. Um, I don't have any information to that so uh, I spoke to the city of Oshkosh civil engineering supervisor uh, Dan Gabrilska uh, around 2 o'clock August 21st regarding this. Uh, he had indicated that there is no plan to connect to the frontage road at this time as part of this project. There is no plan to connect to the frontage road at this time as part of this project that, that we're voting on. Uh, it may be a priority of a future project to connect, uh, but there is no budget or approval for said future project at this time. It indicated it could be years down the road or it, it might not ever connect. And I said, well, what do you mean it might not ever connect? Uh, he explained that uh, possibly like this one, not all plans get approved and come to fruition. And they had done some site surveying and that as that frontage road continues uh, south, uh, there are some retention ditches <coughs> alongside the roadside uh, that, uh, although not quite uh, an impossibility, uh, would create significant challenges and as such would add significant costs to a proposed sidewalk. Obviously putting a sidewalk where there's a ditch would be an issue. Um, so the question is can the council justify approving a proposal that maybe doesn't make sense completely on its own? Uh, I don't think you can approve a sidewalk to nowhere based on the basis of a possible future bigger or more challenging not yet proposed or budgeted proposal that may or may not come to fruition, if you can follow all that. So uh, so now I'm back at square one. A proposed stretch of sidewalk does not benefit the hotel at the corner that doesn't reach, doesn't benefit the field, and it doesn't benefit me, the owner of the property, or that of my tenants. It doesn't make sense. Connecting a storage facility to the back parking lot of a hotel through a field via sidewalk uh, doesn't really benefit anyone except for maybe the guy getting paid to put in sidewalks. So this field I referenced between my property and the hotel uh, on paper is a proposed future road, road called Insurance Way. Uh, if on the city's dime, is the city going to clear that section of sidewalk every time it snows? Uh, I would argue they might be better served to save costs and just leave that section of proposed sidewalk full of snow. After all, who would complain? Only the individuals walking from our storage facility to a back parking lot, which I cannot stress enough, is, is literally not a single person. I'm not sure who this benefits. So am, am I to tell my crew that after plowing four drive lanes of snow, uh, snow blowing and shoveling 352 garage doors on our site, that they are also to clear 80 yards of sidewalk that no one will walk on every time it snows? And I know no one really likes getting the bill, uh, but I, I really don't like being handed a bill for something that I, I, I just can't seem to make sense. Uh, I'm sure that Bike and Pet probably has a plan for sidewalks on most, if not nearly uh, every street or both sides of the street in many cases. Uh, but sometimes in some places, sidewalks don't make sense. And I'm submitting and appealing to the Common Council that this particular stretch of sidewalk uh, is one of those instances. Thank you. Thank you. Jeffrey Darrell Vincent, 3100A Elk Ridge Drive. Yes. I live and represent the Homeowners Association on the southeast corner of Elk Ridge Drive and Walk House. And I last spoke to you on August 12th regarding the north side versus the south side proposal. I've done a lot of research since August 12th. There are 463 renters and homeowners on the south side that would be financially affected 
by this passage of resolution. Most of us are retired and live on fixed income and can't afford any tax increase or rent increase. The north side, which I propose, is almost all commercial and vacant land. All the bus stops are on the north side. They need sidewalks. Um, they wait in the mud in the spring and summer, and they have to stand out in the snow in the middle of one lane to wait for the bus. So the north side makes all common sense rather than the south side. If the south side is approved, 17 utility poles would have to be moved closer to the units. There are three seven-year-old maples that have to be torn down and two blue spruce trees that would have to be cut down to move those poles. It doesn't make sense. Um, this resolution was, I think, initiated by you, Bob, correct? No. No? No. Who did propose this resolution? Propose the resolution? Yeah. Uh, actually, that was brought to us by staff, and the recommendation is part of our bike and pedestrian uh, overarching plan. Well, it's my understanding that Bob is on the bike committee, correct? He's our council liaison, yeah. but let's let's not go into some kind of personal attacks here. That's not what this is for. But a bike lane is going to be installed, if approved, on the south side, correct? That's correct. Okay. If you approve the south side as opposed to the north side, it's going to financially impact <coughs> a lot of seniors. Um, which on the north side it's not so uh, to me this proposal really does not make sense to do it on the south side i live on that corner personally i never see a bike on the south side i always see the north side going toward the outlet shops um, so anyway, I, I just want to tell you, this is affecting seniors living on fixed income, and it's injustice. Thank you. Thank you. Pam, do we have anyone else registered? No, we do not. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for sharing your public comments. Uh, next, we move on to the consent agenda I items. Need a motion and a second on consent so moved second discussion all right please take the roll on consent allison osby aye crozy aye hoogerower aye erickson aye Peschel. aye ford aye palmary aye carried seven all right next we have a pending ordinance uh 20-389 Approved zone change from suburban mixed use district to suburban mixed use district with a planned development overlay for property located at 2755 Algoma Boulevard. Plan Commission recommends approval. I move approval. Second. Discussion. Any discussion on 2389? All right. Please take the roll. Allison Osby? Aye. Crozy? Aye. Lugrower? Aye. 
Erickson? Aye. Peschel? Aye. Ford? Aye. Palmieri? Aye. Carried seven. All right, next is uh, new resolution 20-390, approved <coughs> general development plan and specific implementation plan for commercial and storage use for property located at 2755 Algoma Boulevard. Again, plan commission recommends approval. I'll need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion. Councilmember Ford. Yeah, I just want to bring up that this is a uh, project that um, predates my time on the council when I was on the just on the plan commission, and uh, we had several workshops with the individual that was doing this, and the city went above and beyond in making this project work. The petitioner went above and beyond in making this project work. Just a really good example um, of what we can accomplish here. And that's much appreciated. I think uh, the plans are going to definitely improve that little stretch up there right before the uh, highway roundabout and such. All right, please take the roll. Allison Osby? Aye. Krause? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Peschel? Aye. Ford? Aye. Palmieri? Aye. Carried seven. And uh, the last new resolution on this agenda, 20-391, approved special event. Oshkosh Parks Department to utilize Menominee Park for the Truck or Treat event. That's Truck or Treat, October 17th, 2020. Need a motion and a second on this item. So moved. Second. second. Any discussion? Uh, is Kathy Snell available online? Uh, Jenny McCallion's here. Oh, okay. On behalf of Hi, the Parks Jenny. Department. Uh, maybe you just want to give a little description of what this event is, how it's planned. Thank you. Um, so as you know, we usually have a lot of special events throughout the mic. summer and there, there, spring there. and fall. Um, but this year has been much different for many of us. So we were trying to think of a kind of a fun way to offer a little bit of something for families to do that's safe with COVID restrictions. So we have our normal touch a truck event, which would usually draw like 2,500 people which we're not able to do. And then we have our Zuluween Boo, which is a trick-or-treat event in the zoo, um, which in a two-day usually we draw about 4,500 people. So what we are looking at doing here is kind of doing um, a drive-through trick-or-treat event. And we're combining both events into one event where families can come and drive through the park in their car to trick-or-treat. Um, we'd have the businesses organization set up trick-or-treat booths along the path. And they'd still dress up and decorate their booth. And we'd have a little contest for people to vote which booth they liked the best. Um, and in between those booths, we would have the truck. So we could have a tow truck or a dump truck. And they can also d decorate their truck and take part of it. So everyone would stay in their car. We wouldn't have people out of their vehicles and interacting with each other. Um, the booths would be spaced along the lakefront, the Loop and Menominee Park. And they would be um, definitely six feet apart. And we would sell so many tickets per hour. So. We would sell 250 tickets the first hour um, from 11 to 12, and 250 tickets the second hour um, so that nobody was overwhelmed or it wasn't too busy. Um, and then the vehicles would drive through the park, and the booth would come to them with a mask on and drop their candy in the kids' buckets, and they'd move on to the next booth. So, um, and we we're looking at having some, you know, entertainment, some jugglers or stilt walkers, kind of going along the lines of people when they're waiting to come into the trick or treat loop. So. That's kind of what we're looking at, um, just something fun for people to get out and do and give them a little something to look forward to for the fall. So, It sounds like a lot of fun. Um, just a question. It says that this is a fundraiser and you said tickets will be sold. How much would that cost a family or a car load? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so it will be um, $10 per family. So we don't want to, of course, encourage, you know, like the drive-in movie, every getting in one vehicle. So it's per family. Um, you come through with just your household. So it'll be ten dollars per um, vehicle that comes through, and those will be <clears throat> sold only online. So we have it set up if it's approved, where you can buy a ticket for the first hour from eleven to twelve, or buy a ticket for the second hour from twelve to one. Um, and then you would come in, and you would be able to give them your paper with the tickets that you bought for that hour. Is there also a charge to the vendors that are set up? There is not. Um, their charge is kind of always on. They provide their own candy or safe okay. item of choice. So that gets to be a lot when you have, you know, sure. typically, you know, on a given Zuluween year, if you do like the Saturday booth, um, and that's kind of where we came up with the numbers. You know, typically there'll be 1,400 kids, 12 to 1,400 kids per day. 
Um, so this way, we kind of figured, you know, four kids per car maybe, um, you know, and doing the total of 500 cars that we shouldn't have more than 2,000 kiddos. Um, so it's not, you know, an overwhelming amount that businesses have to have to hand out to the kids coming through, so. All right, anybody else, questions? Councilmember Mover. Thank you, no, I just wanted to say I appreciate the uh, um, getting creative, obviously, you know, <laughs> trying to do something fun yet um, yeah. relatively safe and um, as always, the Parks Department's coming through with, with trying to put something on that's uh, appealing and, and enjoyable for the kids. So appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're, hopefully it'll be approved and we're excited to, to do something this year fun and hopefully people can get out a little bit and enjoy it. So. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. There's no other discussion on 2391. Please take the roll. Allison Osby. Aye. Krause. Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Heschel? Aye. Ford? Aye. Palmieri? Aye. Carried seven. All right, next we have a pending resolution that was laid over from a previous meeting, resolution 20-392, approve installation of new sidewalk, <laughs> West Waukaw Avenue, South Side, from Belfield Drive to South Washburn Street. Take a motion and a second for this item. So moved. Second. Discussion. Looks like we have some staff coming forward. Um, I guess I'd just like to say that, um, you know, I've gone on record many times, almost every single time that's come before me since I've been on council um, in favor of sidewalks going in um, with no exceptions. But I, but I will say that um, this, is, this is challenging because <clears throat> You know, we've heard from a number of people who've come for various reasons, and um, the the most compelling that, that that I think I'm conflicted on is, you know, that the eventual plans, but not really in in the near future, of uh, connecting to, you know, Washburn and and completing a loop, um, it's making it really challenging for me to fully support this particular. Um, piece, but uh, I'll defer to other council members' questions, comments. Can we hear from staff first, actually? Yeah. Would you like to hear from staff? All right. I think we asked for some information relative to that at the last meeting, and that's why we laid it over. So perhaps you have something to add? No, I, I think um, you know we're, we're primarily here to you know answer some questions if you have them. You know, there were a number of questions uh, for additional information that were brought forward at the uh, August twelfth, I believe it was, uh, council meeting. Uh, the uh, supplemental information was included in the packets um, for you um, and in the full council packet, so everyone has access to that. Um, you know, including cost breakdowns uh, by property, similar to what we would normally have for our special assessment hearings. Uh, as well as, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, map as far as uh, potential routing options to connect uh, this particular segment to the greater sidewalk uh, network of the city and um, projected costs for each of those segments. Uh, as a reminder, generally speaking, the capital improvement program allocates approximately $70,000 per year for uh, a new ordered in sidewalk. Uh, so as you can see, based on the map and the uh, cost estimates, uh, maintaining at that $70,000 without any additional uh, funding um, determined or found, uh, it, it would be an, a, quite a period of time before we're able to fully connect. Um, there are some possibilities. Um, I think Justin got into them in the memo a little bit about some of the uh, potential alternative funding sources that could be utilized for, uh, for some of these projects and some of the timing associated with them. So um, we just wanted to make sure that you um, you had that information, and obviously, if you have any questions on that additional information, uh, we're certainly here to answer those for you. Councilmember Ford. Oh, just a question. So, this would obviously not doing this would delay the implementation of the bike and ped plan, have connectivity consequences, but would it have any immediate impact on any development project? That you're no, I, I'm not aware of any immediate impacts to uh, planned development from the area. Thank you. Council Mayor Mugrower. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, that first, thank you, uh, Mr. Robbie and staff for, for working on all that information, getting it to us in, 
and in the format you gave it to us. I was I appreciate the thoroughness and the details. It's it's good to see all the information. Um, you know, in the end, uh, my fellow council members, this is um, it would be a part of a larger plan. Yes, um, a roughly two and a half million dollar sidewalk plan for sidewalks south of 20th Street for the south side of town. That's two and a half million dollars in sidewalks over the course of who knows how long. Um, let me take a step back. I know, you know, uh, some of my previous comments, especially towards the bike and ped, uh, the, the plan and and um, um, and how the committee maybe took some of my comments. Um, I appreciate the, the input and I appreciate the, the time and the effort that our bike and pedestrian uh, committee puts into that plan as well as any of our boards and commissions. It's, it's vital for us to be able to have their, their input. It's important and um, I'm very appreciative of, of their uh, recommendations that they give us. But they work a bit in silos, those, those boards and commissions at times. They're not allowed to think of the budget ramifications. They're not, uh, it's not intended for them to consider how current policy uh, you know, applies with our budget as well as just um, the economic needs and the economic conditions that we live in at the moment. And so that's on us and us seven to figure out at times, is it right or wrong? The negatives outweigh the positives on this one for me uh, quite a bit. Uh, I can't support installing the sidewalks at this time. As part of a larger plan, is it important? Yes. But until we can get there, until we can have a viable plan, until staff and council can figure out a way to, to fund, um, you know, two and a half million dollars worth of improvements within our capital uh, capital project, as well as remembering that that's two and a half million dollars that will be 100% specially assessed to the property owners. That doesn't come off the tax rolls. That's a special assessment to all property owners. Right now, in the conditions we're in, I can't say yes to that. It, it's just. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now. So uh, I won't support it for, for those and, and probably many more reasons at this time. Um, I do have a follow-up question. I'm sorry, uh, Deputy Mayor Krause, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the way I look at this, it's just bad timing, like some residents have said. Um, the future is uncertain with these enhancements and to be a clear enhancement, we have to have a plan laid out where this is going to happen now, this would happen next year, and the following year, and there's no plan. Um, the plan might never even be finished. It might just be one sidewalk that goes in, and that might be it, and then it would be unfortunate. Um, I think with a better plan laid out with clear project dates and reasons for the enhancements to make sense, in my mind, I would support that, but right now I'm not going to support it. Thank you. Um, just a, a, a follow-up question here. If I understand the additional information, and thank you for the detailed analysis uh, follow-up, um, it says after further analysis, the South Oakwood Road connection poses more short-term benefits by connecting largely residential areas with the industrial parks along Badger Avenue and Atlas. Um, I guess my question is, if we didn't use, and this maybe is for City Manager and Mr. Robbie, if we didn't use this CIP money for this particular item, um, could it then carry over and be utilized to one of these more significant ones that you mentioned have more short-term benefits? Yeah, the, um, the money from this year's CIP has uh, certainly already been borrowed and bonded for, so the money is there. Um, you know, that certainly would be uh, something that the council could do is say, you know what, let's not do this one, let's uh, hold that and apply it to uh, one of these other segments. Um, one of the things, you know, we've had numerous staff discussions since August 12th. Um, I want to thank Justin for the amount of time and effort he's put in. Most of this information you've got here is, is Justin's doing, so I want to thank Justin for that. But also Planning Services Director uh, Mark Lyons and Alexa Najunas from uh, Planning Services. The four of us have had a lot of conversations about this. And, you know, you mentioned our, our comments about the South Oakwood Road. And I think what comes directly before that is, you know, we had initially thought that Washburn Street from 20th coming all the way down made the most sense. But um, as we looked at the long-term planning for connecting uh, not only current residential but planned residential expansions along Oakwood as well as the business centers, um, we really did feel Oakwood Road uh, expanding to the south from 20th was the best solution. And, you know, this money could be combined with future year CIPs to start laying that out. And that is one of the things that we are going to start working on is, you know, putting together kind of this 
more overarching plan that you know several of you have mentioned tonight. Thank you, and Councilmember Ford. Yeah, um, so in front of my house, if you follow me on Facebook, you know that I'm the proud owner of a new sidewalk. Mm -hmm. You took all of them, <laughs> which was nice. Um, and no one likes when that special assessment comes due. Yeah. That's not fun. But you know what? My, my kids walked to school on that. It was in disrepair. It was an immediate safety issue. I, I get why it's necessary. Um, I think, as my fellow council members have put, uh, better than I'm going to, um, we're in a very difficult difficult economic time. I think we saw that with the GoEDC um, Go presentation and why I support the work of the Bike and Ped Committee. I think we need to do all we can to make the city as walkable and as connected as possible if we're hurting our small businesses right now. And if you look at the, the staff report, those numbers, they're not inconsequential. I mean, that's a, real, that's a real hit individuals are going to be taking for this. Um, doesn't mean it's a bad idea, but it might mean that it's not a, a necessary idea right now. So for that reason, I'll be voting no. And I think additionally to you know the recent news that the outlet mall is uh, going into some pretty significant financial difficulty. Uh, you know, no one knows what that potential pedestrian demand would be in the near future at that location as well. Um, it's really hard for me to uh, come out and say not right now on uh, bike and pedestrian uh, plan elements, but. This just doesn't seem to be the right fit at this time. I'm sorry, Councilmember Erickson. Thank you. Um, at the last meeting, we mentioned the possibility of, of moving it to the north side. Could you just men or talk a little bit about what impact that would be? Um, as far as a cost standpoint, those numbers are included in the uh, supplemental information. Uh, as far as the bus stops, um, you know, I know several of you have reached out to Mr. Collins, and uh, the ridership on that route is extremely low. So there, there's um, you know, very little impact there. I believe he said maybe a couple of rides a day on average. Um, but as far as the cost implications of, you know, relocating from the south side to the north side, um, you know, again, the total overall cost would be about the same, but it would be split differently amongst the properties. All right. Does everybody have enough information to make a vote tonight? All right. Let's uh, take the roll. Allison Osby? No. Krause? No. Wuerauer? No. Erickson? No. Feschel? No. Ford? Nope. Palmieri? No. Lost, zero, 07. All right, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, council discussion direction to city manager and future agenda items. We have an affordable housing workshop coming up. That's the one that uh, council asked that the uh, develop or the uh, consultant be present. The consultant will uh, be present on September 22nd, and we're looking forward to uh, that presentation. 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Yes, thank you. Quick question. And you would like oh, yes, uh, Councilmember Erickson. Was that so? That's a separate workshop that won't be during the council meeting when that'll I be right at five o'clock. Okay. So it, it, um, a special workshop just for that purpose only, and okay. then. Our goal is to be done by a quarter to six, so you'll be able to get to the six o'clock council meeting. And they'll be presenting at that six o'clock meeting too. Is that the Jackson? No, no, no they're presenting the during the workshop. Yeah, this Got will it. only okay. be this will be exclusively related to affordable housing. Okay. And then the uh, levy target discussion. Looks like council members, we all received some additional information in our packets tonight yeah uh yeah mr van goppel is going to be coming up i don't know jake if you can put up the the one uh worksheet that mr van goppel had put together otherwise we can put it over on the elmo uh if it is that possible you got an extra copy russ yeah that might be good for for people at home watching i don't got to work this either i got jay can do the rest Uh, you can come back over here. You just leave it there. I got an extra okay. copy if you need it, Russ. I just felt for people at home, there might be some value to seeing it on screen while Mr. Van Goppel makes his presentation. Go ahead, Russ. Don't. Just go. 
All right. Um, I think part of the, the process at our budget workshop was talking about some of the potential increases we're looking at in, in, as far as our 2021 budget. Uh, some of those are uh, non-discretionary. Uh, we have a savings coming in on our debt service. I'm in the middle section of the worksheet. And then we have costs for, not fine, for uh, wages and benefits. Um, that is step increases for and, and things that we need to cover based on current employees. And we have discretionary increases, which is, you know, potential adjustments based on contract negotiations, and that's a, an allowance amount at this point in time. And then we have increases for health and dental insurance. Right now that's estimated to be at 7% or about $222,000. So if you take that total of all of those, we're looking at a potential increase of 1.7. That translates to about a 4.41% increase in the levy. Our current levy was $40,737,400. Uh, at the 4%, we generate generate another $1,796,000. One, $1, and then I, I, in the spreadsheet that was in your packet, I included what that would do to the tax rate. Uh, based on the assumptions that I have right now for our estimated assessed valuation, that increase would be uh, 37 cents on the tax rate, on the city tax rate. And that would represent about $56.04 on an annual impact for on a $150,000 home. So that just kind of gives you a starting point of what that might mean. I also have then uh, increments of 1% increases in the levy uh, from nothing up to 5%. So I think um, the city manager and myself are just looking for a little bit further direction as to what type of levy council might be um, able to tolerate as far as the budget process goes. Um, I'm just laying out a bunch of different options for your consideration. Question, Mr. Van Gompel. Um I think we talked about this briefly in the uh, budget workshops. Um, are we going to be due for a reassessment, a citywide reassessment in the next year? Uh, that probably would not happen in 2021, but we, we did talk about that. You have three years after uh, you've come out of compliance, and out of compliance means you have a variance of more than 10%. So you have three years after that. So it, in the next three years, the city would probably be looking at um, doing a reevaluation. By 2023, I think you can count on it. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Ford. <clears throat> yeah, just looking at some of the some of the numbers here. I know that it varies by year, but in recent years, typically our increase has been around four percent. Is that fairly I'd accurate? I'd say it's pretty accurate. It's rough. Um, you know, inflation again, same deal, different benchmarks we can look at, but somewhere between one and two percent. Um, I think that this year it would be my preference because I think we are in extraordinary economic times if we go somewhere below the typical. I think it's fair to go above inflation uh, given our health insurance costs. I mean, some of our major cost drivers are just higher than inflation and we can't do anything about that. So I don't know if two and a half, three percent gives you some, some, some guidance from my point of view. Of course, um, as I said before um, in our, our previous meeting, you know, service impacts matter a great deal. So I mean, I'd want to make sure that we have an idea of what that's going to do, because it's not just about how much we raise, it's about what we do with what we raise. Um, but I think somewhere under four, so two to four would be my comfort zone. Yeah, the, the city manager myself has just started meeting with the various department heads right now, trying to do that balance of, you know, trying to provide the services that all our residents have come to expect and doing that in a reasonable manner. And of course, that's the end goal yeah. is to get to that point. Um, but just kind of giving you a kind of a quick uh, preview of what you know what things are looking like in a big picture format. Then I, I'd have to say uh, I'm between the three and the four, um, um, so that would be 
between 33 and 49 dollars on a hundred and fifty thousand dollar valued home yep other council members I'm just yeah, this isn't intended to be yeah, any is, commitment yeah. on your part. Our goal, and our, you will have a balanced budget presented to you. We will take this input, factor it in, and we'll make a recommendation to you based on that. But hearing where your range is and what your comfort zone is, uh, for example, I'm not hearing anybody say five. So I have a pretty good feeling that <laughs> you're not going to see a budget with a five percent increase. But you know, if, you, if hearing what what we hear tonight. Uh, you know that when we get into the budget, we get into a little more <coughs> level of detail about those things. So, um, you know, d don't consider yourself, you know. Yeah, this is just a preliminary before we get into that right. kind of. And I appreciate it. Mayor's done it, Councilman Ford's done it. So, you know, don't, uh, if, I can't promise what the media is going to do with your statements, but I'm telling you what we're going to do is incorporate it and present you a balanced budget. So other than, or so other than um you know obviously the the wage and and benefits and you know like here the seven percent health increase there's everything else is basically status quo from the previous year with our assumptions here yes so the uh the allowance of nine hundred twenty five thousand for discretionary wage allowance that's what happens with collective bargaining and then what we ultimately recommend for non-represented that allowance is there and then uh, uh, the health insurance that's assuming a seven percent increase uh, we can pursue options to have that go down as low as a zero but obviously there's trade-offs with that and uh, and that'll be impacting employees and council will want to take that into consideration as well um, between before the budget's done sort of the, the tough part is we have to bring you a recommendation on what we're recommending for health insurance about about the same time you get the budget it's not to force your hand it's just that we do regi we register people for health insurance in October so that's that's what we'll do is we'll say okay what do we need to balance and then we'll bring forward uh, the recommended health insurance plan uh, and we will take all these things into consideration uh, but it'll be about the same time you get the budget delivered to you Deputy Mayor Kazi. I would be comfortable up to around 4%. I mean, if you look at the line by line items below, if you go much below 4%, it kind of starts to tie the hands. Um, every year, obviously, things cost more. Inflation of wages doesn't usually keep up with cost of living. So I would be comfortable up to 4%. I'm comfortable between three and four. Same, I agree. I guess I would, I would like to see how things come out with collective bargaining. Um, you know, because as a reminder, you know, we have two separate classes of em employees. So you've got those that go through the collective bargaining process, and then you have those that do not. So um, I could tell you, I'm not a five. Okay, I get that. <laughs> um, but I'm not a zero to two either. So I guess I just would like to see more information. Um, I mean, I've been through how many budget cycles? I mean, we've trimmed subscriptions. Yeah, sometimes we get those surprises. You know, we've yeah, we we get surprises. Um, you know, we've 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 trimmed publications. We've trimmed training. We've you know um, you know types of things that like our general staff goes through. Uh, in a number of things so um, when you look at these percentages and what what we cut down again you know again we have to take into consideration we have we have two different classes of, of employees and we do need to recognize that I don't know that this point in time I think general direction is good but I'm not comfortable saying until we have all the all the facts well I think we you know we've also um, seen in past budget cycles uh, that you know, we we tend to be lower per capita spending on our public safety than many of our peer communities 
And uh, I know I've had several conversations and perhaps other council members have too with those recently who have inquired about um, you know, some of the budget allocations and you know, they weren't aware of the fact that we tend to be the lower spending when it comes to um, our uh, public safety. So uh, this could be, you know, this could be rather critical in that whole forthcoming discussion. I appreciate you bringing that up, Madam Mayor. Yeah. And we just, we do more with less. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we run very lean. Yeah, and I mean, and we also, I mean, we've had discussions throughout the year too, um, you know, that we do contribute a significant amount um, to another stakeholder in the community um, for needs that they have, and we pick up a majority of that tab on that. So, you know, I think I think there's further discussion regarding the budget rather than just making assumptions now. I think September, I think it's too early. But I appreciate you asking us for kind yeah. of a range um, ahead of time so that you can give a little more shape to what we end up with in those final discussions. I mean, th the first step when we're looking at the budget is we'll take a look at the assumptions because the un underlying assumptions are going to have a much bigger impact than us looking at the travel budgets. I mean, those are we're really talking almost minutia. When you take a look at the larger issues, you know, what are we budget what are we going to budget for health insurance and raises across the board on a macro level? Um, fuel is, fuel. I, I'd love to tell you I knew, again, I, I've always said if I could figure out fuel prices, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in the futures, futures market with oil. But the reality is, is we have to make an estimate mm -hmm. on that. And we've, I can tell you one of the things we've probably failed most at is estimating what the cost of oil is going to be. We've gone high and we've gone low. And the year we guess too low and it's higher, we curse ourselves. And when we go high, it's like, well, why did we do so much? You're both right. <laughs> I mean, both arguments make sense. But we're going to take a look at those basic assumptions before we start getting into the, the, the minutia of department budgets. Yeah, and I guess my only uh, closing comment um, is one of the reasons we want to present this to you now is, as we explained in the workshop, 85% of our cost is people cost. People costs and wages and benefits um, because, you know, we're providing a service. And you're going to have to make a decision with, um, you know, final contracts for the, for the bargain employees uh, for those collective bargaining agreements that are coming up. So you kind of, kind of need to know how this all fits in. And that's the majority of our expenditures, and, and the departments have done a good job of curtailing and, and holding down some of those other materials, supplies, contractual services, and those are, are being relatively stable. It's, it's the personnel costs that I think, you know, you need just to keep, need to keep in front of you as you, as you get, go down that line. Just a, a little kidding aside, COVID's done a better job at uh, limiting our travel and training budget than any council I've ever seen in my career. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not put, I'm not throwing that down as a challenge to you, but the reality is that's been one of those things. But, you know, when we're done, I think trainings overall, for example, is going to be changed as a result of this, but it's not going away and it will come back. And, you know, many of us have not gone to conferences and training. Um, we've substituted, but not completely. So, I mean, little things like that, it's just not going to be effective. It's going to be the macro stuff that Russ mentioned. Okay. Sounds like you have what you need. Thank you very much. Appreciate the discussion and the feedback. Uh, next, we have council member announcements and statements. Um, report of any uh, council liaison for board and commissions. I don't know if we had any other than plan commission, which has already been on the agenda for those items. Yeah, and our, yeah. our latest meeting was canceled as well. So. Yeah, yeah. I have one. Oh, so. council member Pesho. Sure. Um, I am the council, rep council liaison to the, the Grand Opera House Foundation Board. So my only real announcement is that the, the Grand uh, technically reopens this weekend. So you can, you can buy tickets to a show, you can watch a, t watch a show online, uh, you can buy ghost tickets, which means you're essentially making a donation to fill a seat that can't be filled at this point. So 
um, the grand is uh, is uniquely situated as as one of the the only functioning um, opera houses facilities in the in the region right now that is going to be opening um, and so our community has this great benefit of being able to see a live show on site in downtown Oshkosh or to be able to still watch that show uh, from home so um, our neighboring communities are not as lucky in, in regards to their 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 show houses and such they've they've shut down their they're regrouping and and looking towards 2021 um, so um, so that's one update the next update is that you'll you'll see a, a new sign I don't believe it's out yet uh, but you'll see a new sign on on the exterior of the Grand uh, that will be what is it oh, I'm forgetting the type of sign do you know Mark EMU electronic yep. message unit so uh, a, a classy and styly one that'll that'll fit in good with the with the neighborhood so they've done they've done a lot of work into it part of the success of that sign actually relates uh, to the work that we've done with that we did with uh, renewing the lease and contract with that it, it provided some naming rights which provided some of the the fronting for that so um, so good stuff going on for the grand opera house right now so just real quick uh, are they doing socially distanced tours of the you know this time of year in the past they've always had the uh, kind of the haunted grand yeah. tours are they doing socially recall. distanced versions of that okay yeah, I, don't, I, I don't can recall. check myself but I thought sure. maybe folks out there might want to know sure. looking for things to do right all right uh, city manager announcements and statements thank you madam mayor a handful of items that, that are in your agenda packet uh, uh, we've hired somebody to work on the stormwater uh, issues related to the reconstruction of West 9th Avenue Brown and Caldwell uh, they've been doing a lot of servicing of our uh, work over in the stormwater utility so we selected them to do that work um, you'll notice that we've got uh, a different air and surface purification system for go transit uh, we're using some of the cares money rather than disinfecting it every night with you know you know spraying it down and cleaning it down this is a constant system you mount in there and then it it constantly uh, disinfects it all day so it's a much more effective way to do it um, Red Arrow Park uh, Red Arrow Park for those of you who aren't familiar with that that is across the street from Oshkosh West High School uh, adjacent to what was affectionately known as Garbage Hill as the mayor <laughs> reminded me this morning and uh, the reason that's so relevant is because uh, as it is an old landfill um, it is continuing to settle so the parking lot if you're a, if you've been a little league parent over the years you know how bad it is and you drive very slowly through that parking lot um, I've been asked over the years well what would it cost to fix it well the, the truth is I don't know the answer to that question the purpose of hiring AECOM and they have a great deal of experience with a lot of our landfill areas um, so we're going to take a look at it and say what's the feasibility of redoing this parking lot as you know we allocate a half million dollars annually to our parking replacement program um, something like this could take three to five years of our parking uh, program so we need to know what that number is and uh, we want to get that started um, outstanding issues are there in the packet um, certainly happy to answer questions you might have the one well there's two I want to point out one that kind of transitions to the next but um, the one with transitional housing I did hear from a representative with the Department of Corrections and I think it was a realization that with COVID, you know, they've been um, not attending meetings. Um, and that's something that the state has basically said, no in-person meetings. And that's not changing for the foreseeable future. So she reached out to say that uh, they would be willing to do an, um, uh, a virtual meeting uh, with the council and the residents. That's gonna be different. Um, and I, I think I would prefer having Trinity team here to basically you know, face council, face the residents, but given the circumstances, the Department of Commerce can't accommodate that request, but they would be willing to do uh, a virtual meeting. Um, just trying to get a, a, you know, a, a feeling from council, is that something you would want to do, knowing the limitations that you're gonna get? Um, Department of Commerce said specifically, 
Trina team has to be present at the meeting, even in a virtual fashion. It will not be a, a useful meeting if Trina team's not there. They need to hear from the council and the residents for that to happen. So I just, uh, I literally got that information, uh, I think, just before I finalized this. So is that an opportunity to hold at a larger venue so there is enough space? Absolutely. I think we'd have to look at an off-site uh, option. Uh, if I got a good feeling that council wanted to proceed with this, um, we would start working on that and, and report back to you when, because I got to get a date where everybody's available. So, um, and I think I remember council saying something way back when was that they wanted it to be on an off-council night because this isn't something you do at five o'clock. This is too important. Uh, for the neighbors as well as council to dismiss it and say, well, we'll give you a 5 to 545. We got to give this a solid two hours. And I guess I just wanted to kind of clarify something too. So on the outstanding issues here, it says transitional housing. It has 1105 Jefferson in parentheses and Trinity, Trinity team mentioned specifically, but this was also to talk about the overarching issue not just those locations and those participants department of corrections uh is certainly happy to talk about that we had put together a rough agenda and part of it was what they normally go through when they're looking at potential locations the 1105 jefferson is just one of those that is is probably the, the biggest one the that people recent. are concerned about mm -hmm. but it's it, it's a fair it's fair for discussion on any transitional housing mm -hmm. options out there just that 1105 has really been kind of the impetus for this discussion so I'm here I'm, I'm feeling that it's okay to to work on a virtual meeting as imperfect as that may be because we'll be waiting for a long time if we don't so I'm gonna I'm gonna proceed with this and I'll report back to council I'm, uh, I'm sorry did you say virtual well, it would have to be a virtual meeting with the Department of Corrections. They will not right, be present. Right, but Trinity, Trinity team would be present, right? No, not, no. Oh, okay, I'm so sorry. So that's the, that's the imperfection with it um, because they're not going to get the same, the same. Uh, you got to be here. Appreciation, yeah, as, as, as being we, there. We, we've said before in different discussions, I'm sorry to interject, but yeah. it's, if you're not in the room, it's a different take. Yeah. And, and if they're not here feeling it and listening, actively listening to the people speaking to us uh, and to them, it, it's a different take. I'm happy to make the request of Trinity being there. Um, and I'll, I can impress upon them the importance of them being there because this is about I thought, we already, I thought we already had that conversation and that was the direction that we were going. Maybe I got confused. Well, but th that was, that all was that was before COVID. COVID. It, it absolutely sure. was the intent. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, clearly that was the okay. intent um, because they're not going to appreciate it as well. Yep. Let me let me do what I can, and I'll I'll, okay. I'll let you know. Um, I think it's more of a DOC thing. I, maybe maybe they can help us talk Trinity team into being present to to hear from council and the public. Okay, um, I'm going to transition from uh, from the status of outstanding issues. I want to talk about the mask ordinance because uh, that is on uh, on the outstanding issues, and it also really is effectively the presentation or the discussion uh, update on COVID-19. Chief Stanley's here, happy to answer any questions you might have, but I think the thing that's sort of weighing heavily right now these days is the uh, you know, is the mask ordinance that statewide is due to expire on September 28th. Um, we only have one more council meeting between now and the 28th, and that'll be September 22nd. I had clear direction from council in, in my eyes, and that's why I ended up putting it on outstanding issues. It was on hold pending status of governor's order. My recollection was that council said, unless if, if, if it gets ch imminent evidence of it being challenged or expiring, that I am to bring it back. So right now, we haven't heard word boo from anybody about what the, the next step is. I've consulted with the county health department, same answer. Um, by next Wednesday, 
I'm putting together an agenda for your consideration for September 22nd. Unless I hear something substantive between now and next Wednesday, so in eight for the within the next eight days, I feel I have an obligation to put it on the agenda per the council's direction. And if we do so, given the feedback we got at the previous meetings, we will need to move this meeting to another location, more likely than not the convention center. You saw kind of the setup we had for the special assessment meetings. And you know, I, I would suspect we would have a pretty sizable group there. Um, at least we have to plan for that. It seems like the other alternative would be uh, what days the 28th fall on? That would be a Monday. So, I mean, the other alternative could be because we've seen some things come down last minute um, from the state to call a special meeting um, if there is not something by that Friday. Um, I mean, yes, we could, but perhaps we end up in language and perhaps the attorney can speak to this um, that it would be in effect if there was at like as of the 28th if council went that direction or I mean we could buy ourselves some time by um, taking that idea and running with it so essentially it, instead of making a decision by next Wednesday whether to put it on the September 22nd agenda we would effectively wait until uh, the 25th and uh, we'd have to check on your availability it's a week of a fifth Tuesday so we don't have a lot of meetings that week typically anyway we we certainly could do that uh, just have a special meeting um, I'm yeah, I know the council's direction was to, to bring it back, and I don't want to shirk that responsibility. The only, my only comment would be it's awfully tight because technically when council adopts an ordinance, it technically doesn't take effect until publication, until publication which would be Saturday, whatever that first Saturday is I in October. I forgot about that. Well, I didn't until we were just talking about um, so, I, so that would have to be for it to go into effect at the expiration on the 28th if that expires it would have to be published on the 26th if the 28th is a Monday yeah. right mm -hmm. okay which puts us back to the 22nd yeah. I think I then yeah. but it was then a great we, idea <laughs> yeah but then close. like you said though it's not really the 22nd it's more like the 18th or 17th yeah so my intent is to bring it back unless something happens and uh, hold that meeting at the convention center. So, um, and I'm, I, it, the intent was not to put anybody on the spot that would be inappropriate from a public um, notice standpoint. This is just me reporting to you that I think that's what I need to do for council and that'll be my plan. Would that then, if we're able to move it to convention center, that would move the workshop? Two that's scheduled before. Yep. Oh, I thought okay. actually, I thought you were when you asked the question earlier. I thought that's where you were going. That maybe uh, you were tracking already. No. Yeah, we're going to have to move it to there. Um, but I think we can have a. Um, yeah, we'd have to do that, and I, we can have an effective workshop. Uh, we'll just kind of keep it closer, you know, for a good discussion there because it's a workshop for council and the consultant and staff, and then we can. In the 15 minutes we have to move things around, we'll have a, a much bigger room mm -hmm. to accommodate. Okay, uh, that's really. Do you want to talk about more closely mirroring the current scenario? Yeah, um, the discussion that the city attorney and I had was that I would say for the most part that the governor's order has been generally. Uh, adhere to mm -hmm. and so I think our recommendation will be to adjust an ordinance before council that closely mirrors what the public has already become accustomed to yes so that it's just yes. more with mm -hmm. virtually everything the same in terms of 
enforcement process, things like that, because the whole idea is to just get keep the numbers up on on masking. So that would be well, our we're goal. Pretty close anyway, but mm -hmm. there it would right. just be a few Did minor city adjustments to make them more identical to what the governor already has. Um, Attorney Lawrenson, did you already learn then as it related to some of the questions that we had previously related to enforceability on other entities like um, the university, which is state governed, and then school district and, and things like that? The governor's uh, order recognizes the, those different those separations as well. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. We I hear what you're saying. So that's what we'll... we'll tweak a little bit uh, due to its familiarity is probably the best way to say it familiarity with what it is so that's the uh, that will be our plan um, the only other two items under my reports unless there's any questions I, mean, I guess the only other question I would have is before we would go to that point uh, I don't know if Chief Stanley or maybe Director Guerin or um, Public Health would want to weigh in on what we've seen with mask compliance, and I guess given that there's, what is it, 21 days to start a new habit, uh, you know, you know, are, are we seeing you know, that become more habituated? Um, is there any way of getting, I guess, some feedback on, on that? Um, obviously, we've had folks come and speak. Um, we've had emails, but I guess, you know, here we are a month smarter, a month further into it, and uh, I'm just wondering if we have access to kind of some of the polling or something out there that gives us an idea of. I think anecdotally um, that the compliance, the participation rate, let's maybe call it participation rate rather than compliance, has been very good. The numbers that we've experienced at City Hall since the statewide order has gone in has been very high. Um, much better than when it was when we had it optional upon entering City Hall. Um, and I think other businesses have done that. Uh, it's not perfect. I've seen a couple places where not as much. Um, but in general, I think compliance has been good. And Mr. Guerin, during our weekly discussions, I think has, has talked about it has been good um, and the goal uh, Dr. Andrabi from Theta Care had used the number if we can get 80 percent participation that will have a, a, a measurable impact uh, in terms of the incidents going down. Councilmember Alsanath. So I guess that's what I would ask for is you know I guess I would want to know is the county going to do anything and is it worth a call to Madison because we went through all of us went through an enormous amount of time only for less than 48 hours after we do something, the state finally does something. Yep. I did put that call in today. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't want to go through that again. Um, it was a lot of staff time. The other thing is too is, so the gentleman that you mentioned from Aurora, he never did give numbers the last time he made the request. However, he had somebody from Theta Care. So I guess the other thing that I want to know is what's the actual data, what's the actual hospitalization rates um, when the gentleman who is the chief of staff for Theta Care shared the numbers it didn't necessarily match the message we were getting so I guess I would like some incredibly very specific factual information and then my question is is the county going to do anything because it's one thing for us to do something but if the town of Black Wolf the town of Vinland Amro, Winnicani, Nina, Menasha have no intent then what are we solving? So, you know, our, what, are, what is their responsibility then at the county level? Very good, thank you. If that's it, I just have two other minor ones, uh, although the chief would disagree with me. Uh, you are more than cordially invited to attend the uh, ribbon cutting for the training tower. Um, it went up in within 24 hours uh, for the most part. Uh, it was really something to, to take a look at. Well, we certainly want to welcome you to come at this Saturday, September 12th at 10 a.m. over on Sawyer Street. Uh, you can enter through National. Uh, and uh, happy to have you there. And 
uh, be able to uh, celebrate the first step in uh, what would eventually be a training facility over there, but the training tower is going to get used pretty soon. Uh, and then lastly, I appreciate the mayor placing it on the agenda because I, if she had, I was going to do it. Council portrait. Um, I think the council has been, for lack of a better term, maybe somewhat cheated out of getting their 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 do over here uh, in terms of their photo in the lobby. Um, uh, Thompson Photography has a very creative way to get all of us in the picture with uh, with maintaining social distancing through the magic of um, photoshopping. So if you can be here on October 13th, you will see the magic uh, get done. Uh, come in however you want to be memorialized. Um, and, uh, and we will uh, get all of us in this photo. I know a few years ago, Councilmember Peck actually missed the organizational meeting and he ended up in the photograph regardless. So I know that Mr. Towns can do it and I appreciate the mayor bringing it up and asking Diane to put it on the agenda. So Mr. Roloff, um, did, did Chief Stanley have any uh, COVID update or? And Madam Mayor, may I? Oh, I'm okay, sorry, Councilmember Allison Asby is waiting. Um, so, Chief, I just wanted to let you know I am actually out of town all day and evening on Saturday, so I will not be there. But um, please, I'll be there in spirit and pretty excited. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Safe travels. Uh, relative to COVID update, you know that we're in a wait and see mode, you know, because of the holiday weekend. You know that throughout this this emergency and this uh, pandemic. After every holiday weekend, we've seen a rise. You know, so it's going to take a few days to see what were the effects of the Labor Day weekend. You know, that's, especially since it's kind of the last weekend of the summer and, you know, unfortunately maybe our last weekend of really great weather. You know, what were those interactions like? You know, that uh, we're continuing to see numbers in the, the state increase, but, you know, there's also the concerns about the number of tests have decreased you know, because of lack of availability in testing sites and things of that nature. So seeing how this balances out over the next couple of weeks is going to be uh, very telling and very interesting because not only do you have the issue of the, the weekend, but you also have universities back in session, schools back in session. You know, so it's really hard to predict what that's going to look like. You know, how, what the, the impact of that is going to be. So, you know, we'll keep a close eye on that. Uh, you know, as, as Mr. Roloff mentioned, you know, a lot of anecdotal supposition, you know, rather, whether it be about what does the, uh, will the increase in positives be, but also, you know, mass compliance or mass participation, you know, hospitalizations, you know, we've got uh, lots of observation and anecdotal type data, but we can, can mine that a little more. You want to ask for some, some more specifics from our partner hospitals that, that we talk to every other week. You know, what, what they had indicated, like I said, we only talk to them every other week. Uh, so last we talked to them, uh, their numbers of hospitalizations here in Oshkosh were still very low. But that's before, you know, as you've seen the reports from the health department, we've been steadily increasing. So we can do some follow-up around that to see what that uh, impact has had on their hospitalizations, if any, we can get back to you. So the state report was, we were like, was it 17 point something percent here recently? Does the local area uh, mirror that? Are you talking about like the positivity rate? Yes, the positive, positive rate. I would uh, guess that it, yes, it does, but like I said, that's directly impacted by the diminished amount of tests. So if you're only testing people that are highly symptomatic, you know, that are getting that referral for testing and getting mm -hmm. prioritized testing, you know, we've seen that that's going to yield a very high positivity rate. You know, the more tests that are available widespread, you know, and you get a bigger uh, sample size that typically has brought that positivity rate down. You know, so because one impacts the other so dramatically, you know, is, is it accurate to say, well, this, this has gotten a lot worse as far as positivity? You know, some of it's perspective. 
And so uh, when city manager Roloff that's asymptomatic can go over and uh, walk in and get a test, mm -hmm. then it's going to bring that number down. When the only people that are, you know, gravely ill and symptomatic can get a test, it's going to bring that number way up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a, a nationwide issue about what's your sample size and you know, who, who on that spectrum is getting tested. I guess I just want to ask a follow-up question um, and, and share the uh, COVID hotline number. I'm just looking that up real quick here. Um, been getting, I, I've been getting a couple of emails or phone calls about, you know, questions related to businesses or employees testing positive. Um, so that COVID hotline, again, is 920-232-3026 for folks who want to call the county and ask questions. But does the, are you, is the fire department or the city getting calls about things like you know, a call yesterday I got at, said uh, someone at work tested positive. Um, what is the employer's duty or responsibility to let the rest of us, you know, employees know? Um, shouldn't we all be quarantining? Those kind of things. I, I mean, this is just kind of a variation on the theme of a number of calls I fielded. But sure. yeah, from the fire department's perspective, we're not fielding those calls. I mean, they go directly to the health department and you know, they're not calling our non-emergency line. I don't know about the, the city. We don't get many calls, but generally that's the advice we give. They need to call the health department um, about what instructions they would provide or advice they would provide. Yeah, so people have self-directed, you know, and found that resource on their own very well, it seems. It's like I said, we're not, not fielding those calls. Mm -hmm. Councilor Allison Osby. Thank you. Here's a question I have, and you don't have to, I don't expect an answer tonight. I genuinely don't know. Because obviously the states were given federal funding for testing, um, and then from the state level, it's supposed to trickle down into the, the communities and the testing center. So I'm just kind of curious where that's at, where the money is being spent. Has it all been spent, or has it been, where where is it? Mm -hmm. um, that not more testing is done. So again, I don't expect anybody to know tonight, but if there's, if somebody knows, that would be helpful to know because I know that's a question that I received is it does, tr the, it, the, the states received it, where, where is it gone from there? Yeah, I mean, uh, I can't uh, tell you definitively. Right, you know, and I don't the, expect an answer. The, the money, but you know, the discussions that, that we've been involved with you know, it's not about being able to buy the tests, it's about the tests themselves being available. You know, the amount of true tests you have, you know, and as there's been these hot spot, you know, widespread breakouts in Florida, Texas, and Arizona, you know, the tests that we were, we were supposed to be distributed to other places, including Wisconsin, have been rerouted you know, and reappropriated to those, those states. And you know, I hate to use an ugly term of hijacked, but you know, FEMA has that ability to hijack those Redirect, kits. I think is the term. Redirect. Yeah, Reappropriate, yeah. right? Yeah, and there's right. just been some conflicting information. So I guess I would like an actual answer from the state. Is that indeed happening to us or what's going on? So I don't again, so they do have the testing site that's just now open that's supposed to be free for everyone up at Sunnyview that has the National Guard and it's supposed to be a permanent yeah. site. I would assume that's one piece of the pie going mm -hmm. there, right? But um, I, I agree, it would be really kind of nice to know more, more details, as Council Member Allison Asby pointed out. Yeah, and we'll, we'll do the best we can to, to come up with that answer, but if you, yeah, get, if getting you can. A, a truly accurate, straight answer may be a challenge. <laughs> you know, that I, there may is not it, be anybody in the country that knows. Is, is, is it true, though, I think part of what I was hearing was that the tests themselves, or the swabs, and and that uh, that those are being done, but the reagent, the processing um, chemical piece of it, to actually process the test is what's creating more of that backlog. Yeah, that was being rerouted or diverted yeah. or whatever. You know, and I know in our conversations with uh, some of the hospitals here, you know, and the and their systems. 
you know, they're exploring, you know, seeking approval to be able to do, put five different swabs in one test tube. You know, so we'll, we'll test five of you, put it all on the test tube. If they all test negative, you're done. You know, if one comes back uh, positive, then we've got to test you again or you know, identify who's the lucky winner or are there multiple, but doing, you know, batch testing to, to do more eliminations. Have so. you had conversations with um, Director Guerin about the sewage sample testing? Because it's my understanding that they are doing that um, within the counties now, and that capacity is there for the um, to show at the local level, the municipality level, and even block level the shedding of the virus. That and, would be and maybe Mr. Robbie. Yeah, has, Mr. Robbie's been dealing with that issue. Because it's my understanding that they. They are able and they are doing that and I believe the university is? No, the uh, University of Milwaukee Freshwater Science has uh, participated. Uh, the State Lab of Hygiene is the one that's heading it up. They are still doing studies. It is not widespread um, sampling or testing or anything. Uh, they are working on studies to determine, you know, to what level they can do it. Um, our plant has been selected to participate but as of uh, yet we have not received all of our instructions for being able to collect samples and send them out. Hmm. Thank you. That's all I have, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Right. I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.